fell and dragged off his feet. He'd thrashed with all his strength, but the current had sucked him helpless over rocks, swept away by a force of nature far greater than he would ever be. Being dragged bodily from his bench by Bremerdan Gorst felt similar. The man's strength defied belief. It felt as if he could have flung Leo from the chamber with one throw. He marched him up the aisle of the Lord's Round, through the coloured splashes of light, past gaping lords, Leo's feet kicking uselessly at the steps, tangled with his badly balanced commemorative sword. "'I'm going!' squawked Leo. "'I'm going!' But he might as well have complained to the tide. Gorst showed no emotion as he bundled Leo from the hall, across the antechamber, then out of the Lord's Round into the daylight. He finally set Leo down with exaggerated care beside a statue of Casimir the Steadfast, feeling much the same sense of awe and relief as he had when the sea finally washed him up on that beach near Ufrith as a boy, but with an added helping of crippling embarrassment. Gorst wasn't even out of breath. "'I hope you realize," he squeaked, "'that this was not personal, Your Grace.' He gave an awkward smile. Please, pass my respects to your mother. What? muttered Leo, but Gorst was already striding back up the steps. The doors were shut on the young lion with a crash and silence pressed in. Enough of this pantomime, snarled Orso. The legs of his gilded chair gave a tortured shriek as he stood, obliging everyone in the chamber to wobble uncertainly onto their knees. He turned towards Wetterland. "'I find you guilty of rape and murder,' he said, in the same icy tone his own mother might have used. "'But—' Wetterland stared over at Isha, as though this was not at all what he had been expecting, but Isha had folded his arms and was meeting no one's eye. "'I am a member of the Open Council. The members—' Of this exalted body must be exemplars, snapped Orso, glowering at the silent lords, held to higher standards, not lower, and subject to the same justice as any other man, the king's justice, my justice, and he stabbed at his chest with a finger. There is no question in my mind of your guilt. I have given you every chance to show remorse, and you have slapped my hand away. I therefore sentence you to death by hanging. Take him down. No! shrieked Lady Wetterland from above. You can't do this! her son wailed as he was dragged away. I'm an innocent man! I was compelled! he screeched over his shoulder, bucking and twisting. Isha! Mother! You can't let them do this! Get rid of him! hissed Glockter, and the practicals bundled him through the side door and flung it shut with an echoing bang. You'll pay for this! Lady Wetterland was screaming. I'll see you pay, every one of you! Take your hands off me! She was viciously beating at a guardsman with her fan as he struggled to manhandle her from the gallery. Also could not bear to stay a moment longer. He snatched up the crown by one pearl-studded prong, turned on his heel, and strode disgustedly for the door. Caught by surprise, the knights of the body only had it open a crack when he got there, obliging him to wriggle through sideways. He flung the crown angrily over his shoulder and left one of his footmen juggling the damn thing, stomped out into the daylight and off towards the palace, shocked bystanders scraping out of his way, his entourage clattering after. Bruckle's gown flapped at his ankles as he hurried to catch up. Well, your majesty, that was... Don't! snapped Orso. They walked in silence, one of the wheels of Glockter's chair catching on every turn with a regular squeak, 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 which might as well have been a saw applied directly to Orso's nerves. He wished he had some honest men beside him. He wished he could have given Malma a seat on the closed council, but he had hanged Malma and two hundred others, and fully earned the scorn and distrust of every commoner in Middleland. Now 
In trying to find a compromise, he had somehow made enemies of the entire nobility, too, with the Union's most celebrated hero foremost among them. And that was without even touching on the man's forthcoming marriage to the woman also quite evidently still loved. What a fucking disaster, he snarled. The High Justice tried to smile, but it ended up a wince. I suppose it could have been worse. How exactly? The Arch Lector raised one brow. Well, nothing's on fire. Savine hurried down the steps as fast as her shoes would allow. Leo, she called. Gorst had left him upright, at least, for all he was leaning against a statue's pedestal, face twisted with evident pain, and his jacket in some disarray. What the hell were you thinking, you thick shit? was what she was burning to ask, but instead she stuffed her voice with concern. Are you hurt? Hurt? I was bloody humiliated! You humiliated yourself, dunce, and me by association, was what she wanted to say. The happy news of their engagement was entirely overshadowed now, but she bit her lip and waited for him to blow himself out. The whole thing was a mockery, and your father— I know. She spoke as softly as she could, for all she wanted to slap some sense into him. People were starting to emerge from the Lord's Round, eager for more scandal. She should have been parading the square like a peacock. Instead, she was scurrying to limit the damage. We should get out of the way. She came close to tug his jacket smooth. Before it gets busy out here. He nodded, then winced all his weight on one leg. His old wound was clearly troubling him far more than he pretended. I left my cane in the chamber. That is why you have me. She took his elbow, one hand draped on top, while the other held it firmly underneath so she could hold him up while it looked as if she were leaning upon him and steer him away from the square of marshals towards the quieter ways while it looked as if he were steering her. This is politics, she smiled at passers-by as if this was the most wonderful afternoon of her life. You have to be subtle. There is a way to do things. So I should just sit there. That's why they have seats in the open council. Watch a man convicted just because of who he is. I have it on good authority. He couldn't be guiltier, said Savine, but Leo was not listening. That high-handed bastard! To have the Lord Governor of Angland dragged out like a beggar! What did you expect? she snapped, digging her fingers into his arm. You gave him no choice. You're taking his side. We're supposed to be Leo. She turned his face towards her so he had to look into her eyes. She spoke to him without fear or anger, with simple authority, the way one speaks to a dog that has soiled the carpet. Sides, think about what you are saying. He is the High King of the Union. His is the only side that counts. He cannot allow himself to be defied before the foremost nobleman of the land. Men have ended up in the House of Questions for less. He stared at her, breathing hard. Then suddenly all the defiance drained out of him. Shit, you're right. Of course, was what she wanted to say, but she kept her silence and tidied a loose strand of hair behind his ear and let him get there by himself. Shit! He closed his eyes, utterly dismayed. I've made myself look a fool. She turned his face back towards her again. You have made yourself look passionate and principled and brave. And an utter fool, it hardly needed saying. All the qualities people admire in you. All the qualities I admire in you. I've offended the king. What should I... That is why you have me. She led him on while appearing to follow, talking softly as though they were trading sweet nothings. I will speak to my father and arrange for you to apologize to his majesty. You will smile and be the charming but hot-headed young hero you are. 
You will show how difficult it is for you to swallow your pride, but you will swallow it every last bitter drop. You will explain that you are a soldier, not a courtier, and say your manly passions got the better of you, but that it will never happen again. And it will never happen again. She smiled as they walked. The union's most admired couple, so very well matched and so much in love. She had smiled through far worse, after all. She kept her eyes ahead, but she was conscious that he was looking at her all the way. I think, he murmured, leaning towards her, that I might be the luckiest man in the union. Don't be ridiculous, she patted his elbow. You're the luckiest man in the world. The Choice Clip, clip, copper-brown hair scattered about her bare feet, across her bare feet, hard fingers on her scalp, tipping her head this way and that. Clip, clip. "'Tis only hair, do you see?' said Isern, pausing with the shears a moment. "'Hair grows back!' Ricker frowned up at her. "'Hair does!' Clip, clip, and more hair fell, like moments past, moments lost. Shivers set a heavy hand on her shoulder. Better to do it than live with the fear of it. That's what my father says, said Ricker. Your father's a wise man. Out of all the men you hate, he's the one you hate least. Her father gave a sad nod. They'll need your bones and your brains when I'm gone. Old he was and crooked and grey. And your heart. And my heart. Ricker wasn't sure whether she'd meant to let go the string or not, but her arrow stuck into the lad's back just under his shoulder blade. Oh, she said, shocked how easy killing someone turned out to be. He looked around, a bit offended, a bit scared, but not half as scared as she was now. She squeezed her eyes shut. By the dead, her head was hurting, jabbing in her face. Jab, jab, jab. Keep it. And I see for you a great destiny, a great destiny. Or give it away, and be Ricker, have a life, push out children and teach them songs. Kaurib shrugged as she sucked fish off the bones, and the wind blew up and made sparks shower from the fire down the shingle and out over the black water. Cook porridge and spin and sit in your father's garden and watch the sun go down. Do whatever it is ordinary folk do these days. They do what they always do, said Shivers. They die. Isern gripped her shoulder. You must choose. You must choose now. Pain stabbed through her head and Ricka screamed, screamed so hard her voice cracked and became a breathy wheeze, a long-drawn rattle. A laugh, Stour Nightfall's laugh. Wet eyes on her as he grinned at the audience, dancing, mocking, and a golden snake was coiled around him. Break what I love! And his sword left a bright smear, a thousand bright smears. She knew where it would be, always. She knew the sword and the arrow, too. She knew too much. The crack yawned wide in the sky, and she squeezed her eyes shut. All she could hear was the clashing of steel a thunder of voices and hooves and metal and fury. She opened her eyes, and by the dead, a battle, a battle at night, but lit by fires so bright it looked like day. Or was it smoke, broken pillars like broken teeth, a lion torn by the wind, ragged and stained, and a sun on a broken tower? There was a flash like lightning, a noise like thunder, and men were ripped apart, horses flung like toys. She sank down in terror, sank among the corpses and the stomping boots and spraying mud, and squeezed her eyes tight shut. It's already over, said a strange high voice. It couldn't be more over. Strong arms forced her down into the dirt, and she kicked and struggled and fought with everything she had, but it wasn't enough. Hold her! Boy, the dead, hold her still! 
Something pressed across her chest, pressed so hard she could scarcely breathe, iron fingers tight across her forehead, pinprick lights burning at her, bright lights like blazing stars in a midnight sky. How much did I drink? she croaked out. All of it, I think, said Orso, putting down the tray. Or was it Leo? I brought you an egg. She lifted her chin a little to give him the eye, but the left eye or the right, she wasn't sure. Lay it yourself, did you? Leo smiled, or also did. I miss you, said Ricca, said it to both of them, but she wasn't sure whether she missed them or she missed who she'd been when she was with them, the Ricca who'd laughed and kissed and fucked and not had to choose. Her face was burning, the left side of her head throbbing, Stink of herbs on the brazier, sickly sweet, so strong she could hardly breathe for it. A long, low crooning, a song in a tongue she didn't know. She's no better, witch. I made no promises. She's worse. Her long eye is stronger than I have ever seen. It fights to be free. Hear me, girl. Kaurib's voice boomed and echoed as if from a long way off. Something slapped at her, and she grunted and grumbled. Have you ever seen a thing entire, through time? Have you known a thing completely? An arrow, croaked Ricca, stirring her thick tongue in her thick lips. From its making to its end, when it flew, I pushed it away with my finger. And a sword, and a crack in the sky. What was inside? Everything. She heard Kaurib give a long, rustling sigh. It's worse than I feared, or better than I hoped. The wards will not be enough. We must go further. Speak another riddle, snarled Shivers, and I will split your head in so many pieces, no stitching will hold the shreds together. Hard fingers gripped Ricca's face, pulled her eyelids open, golden wire blurry in the tricking candlelight. You must choose, said Kaurib. You must choose now. She could smell fire just beyond the mouth of the cave, but she was not in a cave but her father's hall. Burning thatch dropped from the burning rafters, screams outside the doorway. She saw people at the top of a high tower beneath a bloody sunset, a line of them, a queue of them. One by one they fell, one by one they hit the ground beneath. Tap, 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 tap of the needle dipped in the ink, the needle so white and the ink so black, white as snow, black as coal, and Carib's soft singing and the smell of sweat and spice and sickly sweet herbs burning on the brazier. Tap, tap, someone held her hand held her hand tight, and Ricca squeezed it back. I'm sorry, came the whispering, choking voice, breath hot on her ear. But it must be done. A burning pain in her cheek, and she snapped and snarled, but could not move even a hair's breadth, stabbing, stabbing in her face, around her burning eye, and men spilled over a snow-pitched hill, an army, while shadows swarmed across the land from the racing clouds above. Yes, hold her tight. Calm now, calm. She stood upon a wharf, rain falling, clothes clammy on her, and a ship rocked and tossed on the unquiet sea, shields on its top strake, battle-scarred, oars struggling like the legs of a woodlouse tipped over as it crawled closer. Time to settle some scores, said the nail, all shoulders and elbows and fierce grin, and behind his back he held a knife. Scores have to be settled said Shivers, grey hair plastered to his scarred face with the rain. But don't expect it to feel good. And he charged towards a gate, and men charged after him, their boots hammering on a wooden bridge. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, like nails hammered into her forehead, and she gasped and twisted and spat. I can't stand it, she whimpered. Let me up. I can't stand it. You can and you will. 
The bench had ropes around it, and on the polished smooth cave floor salt had been scattered, circles and lines and symbols in salt, candles burning in the darkness, a joke of a witch's cave. Here is your couch, girl, said Kaurib. Looks like a joke, whispered Ricca as she walked towards it, stone cold under her bare feet. You will not be laughing. Clip, clip and the hair scattered across her bare feet. Fucking a crown prince is no great distinction, also laughed, but being brought breakfast by one. She closed her eyes, strained up towards him, and he kissed her lids, kissed her forehead, kissed her cheek, and his kisses became a numb pressing, then a sharp jabbing, then a brutal stabbing, and she growled and twisted, but she was so weak. Steaming waves on the shore, footprints, burning footprints in the shingle. Hold her, then, she's twisting like a salmon. I am bloody holding her. This is fine work, it must be fine work. The bench hard against her hard shoulder blades, and her body rigid and trembling, and the jab, jab, jabbing at her face, and she could see a wagon made of bones rattling along behind skeleton horses. She heard Kaurib clicking her tongue. That one is done. That one will hold. Hiss of more herbs on the brazier, and her face stung and sweated and stung, and she was so thirsty, so thirsty, her eye burned. A wolf ate the sun, and a lion ate the wolf, and a lamb ate the lion, and an owl ate the lamb. By the death it hurts, she croaked. Did she speak? She said it hurts. You can tell that just by looking, you see. Shut up and light that candle. Why did I ever trust you? Old men gathered around a bed, a deathbed, a dead king, and her eye burned. Hang a hide in the mouth of the cave to keep the wind out, now! A woman stood on a high wall, a terrible woman holding a terrible knife. A man leaned beside her on the stones, and she smiled as she raised the blade. Break what they love, she said, merciless, ruthless, and Ricker screamed as the needle jabbed at her face, merciless, ruthless. Send him down, then. I've changed my mind, she screeched, slobbering, desperate, eyes fixed on the needle, trying to twist away. Too late now, girl. She sat down beside Shivers, frowned across the fire at the shanker, gathered in a half-circle, light dancing in their black eyes. One got up, and Shivers reached for his sword, but all it did was sprinkle salt on the cooking fish, a little flick of salt with a neat flick of its crooked wrist. I can't tell what's real and what's a vision, Ricker heard herself say. I can't tell what's then and what's to come. It all runs together like... Paints in the water. She gasped at another stabbing twinge through her eye, gasped and retched, but there was nothing to come up. Felt like she'd puked out everything she'd ever eaten, everything anyone had ever eaten. A great building burned, a high dome crumbled inwards, sparks showering into the sky, showering down the shingle. You must make of your heart a stone, said Isert. Candle flames glinted in Shiver's metal eye. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So cold around her feet, the lake to her calves. She saw her own reflection, a knobbly, clipped head against the racing clouds, turned her face this way and that. Something written there. Eleven wards, and eleven wards reversed, and eleven times eleven. How does it look? she asked. Never mind how it looks, said Isern, frowning. Will it work? One eye fights the other. Kaurib lifted the needle. You must choose. You must choose now. Silence for a moment. Stillness for a moment. Ricker stared up at them, the cold fear spreading through her. Choose an eye? Let Ring the Bells 
Sabine studied her face in the mirrors from every angle, no fewer than nine maids fluttering nervously about her. Frayed with powder and brush, Matello with comb and scissors, Liddy with a mouthful of pins, May with four different colours of thread woven around her fingers. Aside from a wrinkle or two about the eyes, and unless great Aeus could turn back time for her there was no help for that, she saw no opportunity for improvement. Perfection, said Zuri with the quiet pride of a painter placing the last brushstroke on a masterpiece. Hardly. Savine took one last surreptitious sniff of pearl dust, then carefully brushed clean the rims of her nostrils. But as close as we'll get under the circumstances. She had never worked so hard as she had in preparation for this event. There were a great many things that fell short of her standards, but then she had only been given a few days to prepare for seven hundred and fourteen guests, and at this particular wedding she was not the only bride. Indeed, the thing that fell furthest short of her standards was the other one. Isolde Dan Casper, soon to be Isolde Dan Isha, was waiting at the vast inlaid doors, breathing faster than an untried soldier about to meet a charge of horse. She was very young and rather chinless, with a scattering of freckles across her nose and big brown eyes that looked constantly on the point of brimming with tears. I... Never saw such a dress, she murmured as Liddy stooped to make some tiny adjustment to Savine's train. My dear, you're so kind, but it really was thrown together, and it had been in six days. By two corset makers, a goldsmith, three dealers in pearls, an expert in working with them, and nine seamstresses going through the night by candlelight. You look magnificent, too. Isolde blinked down doubtfully at herself. Do you think so? I do. Savine did not. Isolde's dress was a triumph of optimism over taste, and accentuated all her worst features. But its inferiority to her own would be so utterly obvious to anyone watching, there was no point in saying so. That's such an unusual necklace. Runes. Sabine stretched out her throat as Yuri gave an infinitesimal tweak to the way they sat. Everyone here had diamonds, after all, but these gave her a dash of the exotic. She was the least superstitious person alive, but they felt like good luck somehow. They were a gift from... An old lover of my husband's did not sound quite right, so she settled for... A friend from the north. Will your parents be here? a more complicated question than Isolde probably realised, since one of Savine's fathers was dead and the other not actually her father. She settled for both of them. You're so lucky. I have hardly any family left. My uncle died before I was born on campaign in the north, then my father last year and my mother a few months after. I never had any siblings leaving her, no doubt, with quite the inheritance. Savine began to divine what made her so irresistible to Lord Isha. I only wish one of them had lived to see this. I am sure they would have been proud, and somewhat relieved to be rid of her. Savine took her gently by the shoulders. Today you will gain a whole new family. I know your husband to be a good man. She suspected him of being a devious scorpion. And from the way he talks, he is very much in love with you. Isolde blinked up at her. Do you think so? Savine did not. How could it be otherwise? she asked, chucking Isolde under the chin and making her smile. Zuri, could one of the girls help Isolde with her powder? Blessed is she who gives succour to the needy, Lady Savine. I'm sorry croaked out Isolde as May attended to her face. I don't mean to be a burden. Don't be ridiculous, said Savine. I should be the one apologising for stealing half of your big day, and with so little notice. It has been quite the whirlwind. It's good to have someone to share it with. Isolde looked down at her shoes. To take some of the attention. I understand entirely. 
though there had never been enough attention in the circle of the world to satisfy Savine. The Lord's round! Isolde stared at the huge doors. Beyond they could hear the vague murmur of the gathering witnesses, almost as many as had witnessed Wetterland's trial. So many people watching. Everyone who's anyone. Savine had spent several hours poring over the guest list with Zuri and her mother in order to make absolutely sure of it. The king is here, whispered Isolde. Savine found her nonchalance slipping a little at that. Yes. Do you know him? We have met. He is a good man, regardless of what you hear. My husband-to-be doesn't seem to think so. For some reason that caused Savine a stab of anger. Luckily, I am not obliged to agree with Lord Isha. I am, said Isolde in a tiny voice. By the fates, her eyes were already brimming again, making her powder run. It can be pleasant to have someone weak leaning on you. It can make you feel strong. But there comes a point when they become a dead weight to carry. Savine was happy to play big sister, but she drew the line at motherhood. She would have her own child to worry about soon enough. You are being married to the man, she said, less gently now. Not sold to him. I suppose... Isolde took a heavy breath. I wish I had your grit. Savine was far from sure that grittiness was the quality most sought for in a bride. She took Isolde by her limp little hands. Act as if everything is going exactly according to your plans, as if you are the most confident person in the world, as if you never had a doubt in your life. Savine forced her shoulders back, her chin up, and faced the door. It works for me. Does it? asked Isolde. Really? Savine paused a moment, mouth half open. Then she slipped the box of pearl dust from her sleeve and offered it out. There's always this. Ready, my friend? asked Isha. Leo forced a watery smile towards High Justice Bruckle, standing by to officiate, his robes trimmed with so much fur he looked like a giant, disapproving badger. Can't wait! Leo had always reckoned himself the bravest man in any company. They called him the Young Lion, after all. But standing here, on the marble floor of the Lord's Round, well-dressed, well-fed, well-attended, and in no danger of violent death— he was terrified. There are different kinds of courage, maybe, and the kind that lets you fling yourself into a thicket of spears has nothing to do with the kind that lets you stand smiling in front of a thousand people and give your life to a woman you hardly know. He wished his friends were there, his real friends, Antaup with his endless chatter about women, and Glarwood with his endless chatter about weapons— and Whitewater Gin, with his beard and his belly laugh, and good old Durand, most of all. Durand, with his caution and good sense. Durand, with his endless patience and support. Durand, with the fine shape of his jaw, and his hair falling in that artless mess, and the perfect definition of his lips. Leo shook himself. He even wished he could hear Barnava wax on about the horrors of war one more time, but, as if to prove his own point, the poor bastard had got himself killed in a war. And none of them were invited anyway. There had been no time to send for them. Leo had come to Adua to attend Lord Isha's wedding and make new friends, not to make an enemy of the king and get bloody married himself. He felt another surge of nerves. Could you call it cowardice? He found he was glancing about for some route of escape, more little rabbit than young lion. He caught sight of his mother, who gave him an encouraging nod, then Lady Ardy, who gave him an encouraging wink, then her husband, the arch-lector, who gave him a bitter glare, which entirely undid all the lady's support. Finally, King also, slouching on his cushions in the middle of the front row, jaw angrily clenched. Leo turned his back on them mouthing the over-rehearsed apology Savine had arranged for him to give later. 
Your Majesty, I'm a soldier, not a courtier, a simple soldier. I can only apologize. I let my passions get the better of me. No excuse will never happen again. Please rise, bellowed Bruckle. There was a rustling as the hundreds of witnesses stood, an echoing fanfare from the gallery, garlanded with spring flowers, and a mighty creaking as the doors were heaved open and the two brides stepped into the light. Whenever Leo saw Savine, she was somehow more than he remembered. But now, in ten thousand marks or more of soljuk silk, Osprian lace, and pearls from the distant thousand isles, Advancing so proudly, so gracefully, so dauntlessly down the aisle, he couldn't take his eyes away. No one could. The future Lady Isha was a simpering little girl by comparison, the blushing maid beside the peerless empress. Savine was doing her best not to outpace her, to hold her hand, to show her off to best advantage, but poor Isold was utterly upstaged at her own wedding. It didn't help that she appeared to be constantly suppressing an urge to sneeze. It was as if all these people were the setting of the ring in which Savine was the jewel, as if the Lord's Round had been built especially for this moment. Perhaps you can borrow courage from someone else. As Savine joined him at the high table, Leo's doubts were wiped away. With her at his side, there was nothing he couldn't do. He was the young lion again. She gave him a look up and down, nodded approvingly, and raised one perfectly plucked brow. You came, then? Are you choking? Leo turned to the High Justice and gave him a grin worthy of a famous hero. I wouldn't miss this for the world. The spring sun shone on the park, turning every dewdrop to a diamond. Dappled shade danced on the manicured lawns under trees that had been ancient in Casimir's reign. A gentle breeze brought only the slightest scratch in the throat from the chimneys that towered over the agriant on every side. Everything crisp and bright and ready to burst forth with new possibilities. Lady Finry Dan Brock and Lady Ardy Dan Glockter, mothers to one of the happy couples, glided about the gathering arm in arm, an all-conquering double act, the one imposing military precision on the serving staff, the other administering risque anecdotes to every guest. So many different styles of laughter, hearty guffaws and bubbling chuckles from the gentlemen, silvery giggles and tinkling titters from the ladies. A truly wonderful time was being had by all with one notable exception, of course. Also would rather have been anywhere else. The dungeons of the Emperor of Gurkel held more appeal at that moment. It was hard to imagine greater torture, after all, than the glorious wedding of the woman he loved to a man he decidedly didn't, where the guests consisted of a range of sneering enemies— bowing and scraping to his face, then spitting scorn as soon as he was out of earshot. With every day that passed, he was coming to understand, even to admire, his father more. The man had played the eternally losing hand of being king about as well as was possible. He lifted his glass and glumly watched the way the sunlight sparkled through it. The oblivion of the bottle, then. Wine had never let him down. More importantly, he had never let it down. Your Majesty? It was one of the grooms, not the one he hated, the one he utterly despised. Lord fucking Isha, even more immaculately polished than usual. I wish to give you my unreserved apology for the events in the Open Council. I am devastated. Who could have known that Lady Wetterland would renege on her commitments and turn on us both? also had spent a great deal of time pointlessly rehearsing the events of that day, and, though he could prove nothing, he strongly suspected Isha had orchestrated the whole thing. To Lady Wetterland he blamed Orso. To Orso he blamed Lady Wetterland. Then he teased out Leo Dan Brock's little performance, and imagined he would come through greatly empowered and still everybody's friend. 
The desire to punch him in the face was almost irresistible. But breaking his treacherous nose in front of several hundred guests, though satisfying for a moment, would only have played into Isha's hands, and also had done that quite enough already. Plainly, Isha thought him an utter fool. Better he keep doing so. You have nothing to apologize for. Orso tossed his empty glass into the bushes and folded Isha in a tight embrace. I know you did everything you could. Those bloody wetterland stabbed us both in the back. He held Isha at arm's length and smiled, smiled, smiled. Some dogs are a danger to everyone, have to be put down for the general good. And you can hardly be blamed for Lord Brock's outburst, although he most certainly could be and most certainly was. The man has a soldier's temperament, said Isha. I know how desperately he wants to apologize for his behavior. Not everyone is a politician, eh? Heart of a lion and so forth. It's a shame how things went, but, ah, and also snatched two glasses from a passing waiter's tray and pressed one into Isha's hand. There's as much need for cooperation between the Crown and Open Council as ever. More. I hope we can work together again to bring it about. This time, with a happier outcome, such as Isha's neck in the noose rather than Wetterlands, for example. To your happiness, my friend, and that of your charming bride, of course. Isha gave a slightly surprised smile. Of course. Their glasses chinked pleasantly together, and also thought about how much he would have loved to smash his in Isha's face and grind the jagged remnant into his groin. But all in good time. Cheers! Cages sprang open, and songbirds swarmed into the air above the gardens, a flurry of shimmering blue and purple feathers, imported from Gurkle, Broad had been told, at a cost he hardly dared imagine. Half had died on the way over. He'd watched them clean the cages out, heaping up the shiny little corpses. May gave a delighted giggle as the survivors twittered sparkling into the sky. Beautiful! The guests clapped politely and straight away turned to other entertainments. No doubt the birds themselves were meant to loiter in the trees and serenade the newlyweds, but they soon scattered to the wind. Broad doubted they'd last long in this climate. Only one was left on the lawn, weakly cheeping, looking almost as baffled as Broad felt. How much did it all cost, you reckon? May winked at him. She'd held the books, had one eye on the sums, but she treated the number like a beautiful secret rather than a guilty one. Better not to ask. A lot better, probably. But he couldn't help himself. For what Savine had spent on that one dress, which Liddy would help cut her out of in a few hours, and she'd never wear again, she could have paid her workers on the canal more than they'd asked for, and got the thing dug without one bone broken. For what her father, the arch-lector, had spent on the wine today, maybe he could have built some better houses in Valbeck, and folk wouldn't have been stuck in rotten cellars, and the breakers wouldn't have risen up, and two hundred good people wouldn't have been hanged. For what Lord fucking Isha had spent on this dinner for seven hundred, the valley Broad grew up in could have been left as it was. He could have been herding now the way his father had, along with all those others thrown off their land. Was he the only one who saw it? Was he the only one worried about it? Or was everyone like him? They saw, and they worried, but they somehow didn't fucking do anything. Doesn't she look beautiful? murmured Liddy, watching Savine Dan Brock sweep past with her husband, envious lords and ladies swarming after them like the tail to a comet. Aye, said Broad, pushing his lenses up his nose. She did look beautiful. Everything looked beautiful, even them. He'd never seen his wife and his daughter look so fine, so well-fed, so happy. It's easy to scream about the fence when you're on the wrong side of it. Some mad twist of fortune lands you on the right side, though. The fence starts to look like it might not be such a bad idea. Might even be worth all the sacrifices. 
Other people's sacrifices aren't that hard to make. All worth it, eh? said Liddy. She was talking about the night she'd spent stitching by candlelight, he reckoned, not the nights he'd spent beating men by lamplight. Had that been worth it? Aye, he croaked out. He forced the smile onto his face. He was doing that a lot lately. Leo sat, watching his wife dance, whirl, twist, smile, flitting effortlessly from one partner to another. His wife. Just thinking the words gave him a guilty thrill. She was an enchanting dancer, it hardly needed to be said. Leo would have liked to join her and soak up his share of the admiration, but he'd never been much of a dancer, even without the leg wound. Few soldiers are. Ant help, maybe. He wondered what his friends would say when he presented his bride. Speechless, most likely. How could they be anything but impressed? How could anyone? Not dancing, your grace? It was that woman with the red hair and all the bosom he'd met last time he was in Adua. The leg, you know, still a bit sore. A shame. I can't remember such a spectacular wedding. Thank you. A moment of horror at not knowing her name, then a wash of relief as it came to him. Celeste, so glad you could come. Oh, Bias could have locked me in the house of the maker, and I'd still have found the way to attend. She tapped him on the chest with her fan. That's two wonderful shows you've put on in the Lord's Round. Leo winced. You know about the other one. My dear... Everyone knows about the other one. Well, I'm meeting the king later this evening. I'll say sorry, and that'll be that. Of course. I suppose there was always going to be some friction between you and his majesty, given his history with your wife. Leo felt a coldness creeping up his spine. What? Rumor has it they were lovers, she purred. But I'm sure Savine told you. It's hardly the kind of secret one would want hanging over a marriage, after all. The music struck a false note suddenly. Was that why Savine had been so worried about the king's feelings, so keen for Leo to apologize? He felt a surge of fury, and the pain in his leg as he leaned towards Celeste Dan Huygen only made it worse. He forced the words hissing through his fixed smile. If I hear you've spread that rumour, I'll break your fucking nose. She looked rather pleased with that. One of those people who count anything but being ignored as a victory. There's really no point getting angry with me, your grace. I didn't fuck the king. She left him sitting, watching his wife dance, whirl, twist, smile, flitting effortlessly from one partner to another. The sight no longer filled him with quite the same delight. It was done. It was done and could not be undone. Orso drained yet another glass, wondering if there was some kind of drinking record he could aim for, something to give his life purpose, something more than staring at Savine and thinking about all he'd lost. He glanced over to Brock, who for some reason appeared to be frowning angrily back, and raised his empty glass in a pointless toast. That bastard was everything or so wasn't. Honest, decisive, likable. Crushingly popular with both nobles and commoners. A storybook hero with no crowd of mistakes at his back. Unless you counted the one he'd made in the Lord's Round, the one he was apparently so very keen to apologize for, and that only appeared to have gilded his reputation. Hot-blooded and passionate, don't you know? Anyone would have thought the most admirable thing a man could do in open council these days was berate the monarch. Blame sticks to some men, he murmured under his breath. Others it slides right off. Dinner will be served shortly, Your Majesty. A powdered footman gestured towards his chair, the largest chair, of course, in the very centre of the great polished horseshoe of table. He wondered how many trees had died to make it possible. 
If it please your majesty, you are to be seated between the two brides, the grooms just without to either side. And he managed to back away and bow simultaneously. Between the two brides, as though to emphasize how alone he was. He would rather have been seated between the great wolf and the snake of Tarlins, far rather. He did not have nearly so ugly a history with them as he had with Savine Dan Glockter. He realized he had to correct himself. Savine Dan Brock. Fuck! he snarled. He could stand it no longer. He could stand himself no longer. Gorst! Your Majesty! Where might we find Corporal Tunney these days? The Lord Governor of Bloody Angland could apologize later if he cared to. I think I've had quite enough of other people's happiness. Savine shut the doors and leaned back against them, taking a moment to breathe. Her cheeks burned from the dancing and the compliments and the endless smiling and the ever greater quantities of pearl dust. She could hardly feel her face any more. She simply had to get some air. So, a married woman. The sight of her father soon cleared her spinning head. He sat in his wheeled chair on the terrace, deep-lined face tipped back, gazing at the stars. They say it's the proudest day of a father's life. They say all sorts of nonsense. His opinion had meant everything to her once, but she found right now she hardly cared. She was eager to shrug off the wreckage of her past life like a snake sheds its skin and sweep away smiling towards her bright new future. There is no guide to being a parent, Savine. He turned his head slowly to look at her, eyes bright in the darkness. Especially if your parents did as poor a job as mine and your mother's did, you reel from one mess to another and chart the only course you can see at the time. We meant to tell you the truth, but when is the right moment to share a thing like that? We preferred the pretense. We did not want to hurt you. She gave a bitter snort. Then congratulations on your spectacular failure. Hardly my first. One day... I hope you will see that we always tried to act in your best interests. You could have warned me. Not to bed the crown prince. Hardly advice someone of your talents should need. Perhaps he had a point there. Besides, we agreed long ago that I would give you some privacy. How was I to know you would become involved with the one man who was off limits? And from what my mother tells me... It does rather run in the family. A silence, and she saw the side of his face twitch in the warm light from the party, and he reached up and wiped a streak of wet from his leaking left eye. Well, a life without regrets is not a life at all. It is in the past now. I know I cast a long shadow, Savine. I am glad you are ready to step out from under it. Just... Be careful. Aren't I always? You will move in different circles now, as the Lady Governor of Angland, no less. I'm used to hard decisions. It felt as if her life had been one after another. You are used to business. This is politics. The way things are going... Well, take care. And promise me one thing. He beckoned her close to whisper, Have nothing to do with Piaz. Not with him, not with any Magus. Take no favours from him, owe no debts to him, make no deals with him. Do not please him, do not displease him. Do everything possible to escape his notice altogether. Promise me. All right she said, frowning. I promise. If she was to have a statue on the king's way, she supposed she would have to win it for herself. Good. Good. Her father winced as he settled into his chair, drunken applause in the background as a dance came to its end. The time may soon come when I cannot protect you any more. 
Is that what you've been doing? Believe it or not, I've been trying. He frowned over the rooftops towards the dome of the Lord's Round, the great black shape soaring high into the night sky, a grand replacement for the one destroyed the year Savine was born. Sometimes, he murmured, the only way to improve something is to destroy it so it can be rebuilt better. Sometimes, to change the world, we must first burn it down. Savine raised one brow. Valbeck may be better in the years to come, but being there while it burned was far from pleasant. The Emperor's prisons were far from pleasant. He licked at his empty gums with a faint sucking. But I emerged a better man. Being your father is the thing I am proudest of. It's the only thing I'm proud of. And you're not even my father. She wanted to strike some spark of anger from him, but all he did was slowly nod, a trace of a smile as he looked up at the stars, bright in the clear sky. That should tell you what I think of everything else I've done. Beyond the windows, the band struck up a jaunty reel, one of her mother's favourites, people clapping and stamping and laughing in time. Could you wheel me back in? She thought about wheeling him off into the flower beds, but in the end she took the handles of his chair and turned it about, that one wheel slightly squeaking. I can do that. Future Treasons, Past Affairs Leo raised his fist to knock and paused, clenching it so hard his knuckles clicked. It was a bloody humiliation. He'd never had much respect for Orso as a man, and he'd been losing respect for the crown as an institution for months. Now he had to spend part of his wedding night begging for forgiveness from his wife's former lover. It was an utter bloody humiliation. But it had to be done. He was a leader and a husband, soon to be a father. He had responsibilities. He was starting to see that humiliations came with the territory. He forced on a smile, seasoned it with just a sprinkle of shame, turned the doorknob and stepped through. Your Majesty, I... You could have said there were a lot of kings in that vast salon. Twenty, at the least, of the Union's best, in uniforms, hunting garb, full armour, perched on gilded chairs or astride mighty steeds, sneering, smirking, pouting down at Leo from towering canvases. But of the current throne stuffer, there was no sign. In fact, the only living occupants of the room were Lords Isher, Barazin, and Huygen, gathered around a table in one corner in a secretive huddle. Leo, called Isha, raising his glass. It seems the king couldn't stay. More important matters, said Huygen, leaning to light his pipe at a candle. At the whorehouse, I understand, added Barazin, sloshing amber spirit from the decanter and nudging the drink towards an empty chair. Leo felt angry colour rising to his cheeks as he limped over. The whorehouse! All the effort he'd put into his apology, and the arrogant bastard couldn't even be bothered to hear it? If you ask me, Huygen puffed out sweet-smelling chagger smoke, you've not a thing to apologise for. You told the truth, said Barazin. Everyone knows it. He's the one should apologise. Kings don't, grumbled Leo, dropping into the empty seat and snatching up the drink. Not this one, anyway. Well, shit on him! Leo drained his glass in one swallow and slammed it down in a rush of fury. I've had enough. We can't let things carry on like this. He glared at a painting of Orso's father, King Jazal, handsome enough, but with a helpless set to his shoulders even as a young man. An ineffectual ditherer who lost every war he'd fought and achieved nothing but unmatched debts, and his reign was starting to look like a golden age. We can't let the Union just slide into the fucking sewer. 
Isher gave Barazin and Huygen a significant glance. There comes a point, he said with great care, when talking about a better world is simply not enough. There comes a time when men of conscience, principle, and courage must dare the unthinkable and fight for a better world. There was a long expectant silence. The hairs on Leo's neck prickled. A clock on the marble mantel tick-tock ticked. He looked the three lords in the eye one after another. Isha spoke far from plainly, but at the same time left no doubt what they were discussing. Mightn't some men call that? Leo licked his lips and shuffled forward on his chair, hesitating to say the word in full view of all those painted monarchs, and finally forcing it out in a breathy murmur. Treason? Huygen gave a huff of upset. Barazin's jowls wobbled in denial. Isha firmly shook his white head. We would be acting in the king's best interest, in the country's best interest. We would be freeing his majesty from the chains of his closed council, said Huygen, his airy gestures making Leo think of liberty and honesty, and most certainly not treason. We need to replace those corrupt old bastards with patriots, boomed Barazin, filling Leo's glass again. Men who can give the king the right advice. Isha waved towards a painting of Harrod the Great, who'd first forced the splintered kingdoms of Middleland together into a union, and looked exceedingly pleased about it, too. Guide the union back to its founding principles. Back to glory! Barazin punched his palm as if it was nowhere near glorious enough. Men of action! Men who can make the union great again! Men like us? said Huygen, eyebrows raised as though the idea had only just occurred. The closed council are the same self-serving liars who lost us three wars against the Styrians, hissed Isha, and Leo could hardly deny it, who nearly drove Westport out of the Union, who turned the commoners against us to the point they burned one of our greatest cities. They're the enemies of the state. Ousting them is the act of loyalists. Loyalists, mused Leo, taking another drink and feeling its heat spreading. He'd always been fiercely loyal, no man more of a patriot. But what was he loyal to? A coven of greedy bureaucrats who'd sent him no help in war and only outrageous demands for tax in peace? A libertine king who'd had him thrown from the Lord's round and, it seemed, fucked his wife? Leo frowned up at the painting of Casimir the Steadfast, who'd ripped Angland from the clutching hands of the Northmen, strong-jawed, fully armoured, and pointing out something on a map. There was a king. There was a man. He seemed to be challenging Leo with his piercing stare, as if to ask him, What the hell are you going to do about all this? What would Casimir have done? What would any good man have done? Leo looked the three lords in the eye again, one after another, and drained his glass. Well, he said, you all know I've never backed down from a fight. Now they huddled in close, united by a common enemy and a shared purpose and a righteous cause. Just talk, of course, fueled by Leo's frustration and jealousy and the pain in his leg. Just talk, perhaps but dangerous still, exciting still. Just talk, wasn't it? But with each word said, it became more thrillingly real. It might be a fight against friends, murmured Barazin, glancing towards the window. Against neighbours, against colleagues. Certainly against your father-in-law, said Isha. The king dances to his tune. If we on the open council have one enemy, it's the arch-lector. He may be my father-in-law, said Leo, but I'm no friendlier with old sticks than you are, less if anything. We would need a leader, said Isha, a military man. A latter-day Stolicus, frothed Barazin, filling Leo's glass again. 
a man whose name inspires respect on the battlefield. Leo's heart beat faster at the thought of strapping on his armor. He belonged at the head of ranks of cheering soldiers, not harassed and henpecked behind some dusty old desk. He smiled as he thought of the marching boots, the wind taking the flags, the ring of drawn steel, the drumming hooves of the charge. How many men could we count on? he asked, sipping steadily. It really was a hell of a brandy. We three are committed, said Isha, and many other members of the Open Council are with us. Most, said Huygen, almost all. You sure? Leo got the vague sense they had been thinking about this for a while. They have been frustrated for years, said Isha, chafing at the taxes, the infringements, the insults. Wetterland's treatment and yours, a genuine hero of the Union, mark you, in our own Lord's Round, was the final straw. You're damn right there, grunted Leo, clenching his fists. He couldn't tell if all this was just talk or not, but he was starting to hope it wasn't. Could you count on the forces of Angland? asked Barazin eagerly. Leo thought of Durand and his friend's loyalty, Mustard and Clencher's fury, the soldiers cheering for the young lion. He drew himself up. They'd follow me into hell. Good to hear. Isha tapped at his glass with one well-shaped fingernail. But we do not want it to come to that. Even with the Open Council and the Army of Angland united, we could not be sure of victory. We must take them by surprise, said Huygen. Field a force no one would dare to resist. We need outside help, said Barazin. Leo frowned into his half-empty glass. The dogman has hundreds of hardened warriors. And he owes you? said Huygen, for your help against Iron Hand. He's an honourable man, a true straight edge. He might join us, if it was put to him the right way. Who understands the Northmen better than you? asked Isha. Who has been their neighbour, fought beside them, lived among them? Leo gave an artless shrug. I've got some friends in the North. Without doubt. Isha glanced at Huygen, then at Barazin, and then back to Leo. Not least the king of the Northmen himself, Stour Nightfall. Leo froze, glass halfway to his mouth. Not sure I'd call him a friend. He owes you his life. But there's a reason they call him the Great Wolf. He thought of Stour's hungry smile, his wild, wet eyes the legions of merciless Northmen they'd faced at Red Hill. He's savage, bloodthirsty, treacherous. But you could keep him on the leash. Barazin clapped Leo on the shoulder. And how many warriors could he call upon? Thousands. Leo tossed down the rest of his drink and pushed the glass back for a refill. Many thousands. She was there in a vast living room when he opened the door, arranged on a chaise in a great flood of cream skirts, with the usual care, as if a sculptor had positioned her just so as his model. "'Your Grace,' she said. "'Your Grace?' returned Leo, sounding grumpy and drunk. "'You've been waiting.' "'Traditionally, brides do wait for their husbands on a wedding night.' I'm sorry, he said, not sounding sorry at all. I was held up. He glanced towards a chandelier of viscerine crystal, which must have carried a hundred candles. These are our rooms. You have a dressing room through there, and a bedroom beyond. She pointed out a distant doorway, through which he caught a glimpse of manly panelling. My rooms are that way pale paint and tapestry in the other direction, a dressing room big enough for ten, but then it probably took ten to dress her. We're not sharing a bed, he grumbled. She spread her arms across the back of the chaise. I suppose that depends on your mood. He frowned up at a vast canvas, a masterful-looking military man in a neat black uniform frowned back. Who's this? 
your grandfather. Lord Marshal Croy. He'd commanded the Union Army at the Battle of Osrong and died when Leo was small. He only remembered the man from stories, really, but there was undoubtedly a hint of Leo's mother about his withering frown. Couldn't find one of my other, Grandfather. They're in short supply. He was a famous traitor. That way. Pale paint and tapestry in the other direction, a dressing room big enough for ten, but then it probably took ten to dress her. We're not sharing a bed, he grumbled. She spread her arms across the back of the chaise. I suppose that depends on your mood. He frowned up at a vast canvas, a masterful-looking military man in a neat black uniform frowned back. Who's this? Your grandfather. Lord Marshal Croy. He'd commanded the Union Army at the Battle of Osrong and died when Leo was small. He only remembered the man from stories, really, but there was undoubtedly a hint of Leo's mother about his withering frown. Couldn't find one of my other grandfather. They're in short supply. He was a famous traitor. Leo flinched at that. Maybe treason ran in the family. He wandered across what felt like an acre of Gurkish carpet between carefully arranged groups of furniture past a stuffed songbird in a glass case. This one room was the size of the dogman's hall in Ufrith. He wondered if it had been built from scratch in the week since he proposed, or she proposed, or their mothers proposed. It wouldn't have surprised him. There didn't seem to be anything Savine couldn't organize, or wouldn't organize given the chance. I thought decorating might bore you, she said. If there's something you'd prefer, I can change it. It's fine, he grunted, frowning at two antique swords crossed over the mighty fireplace. It was about the finest room Leo ever saw, in fact. A perfect balance of money and taste, clearly done with his feelings in mind. He should have thanked her. But he was drunk, and his leg was sore, and he was in no mood to thank anyone, particularly not her. Did you speak to the king? Leo ground his teeth. He didn't bother to turn up. Had to get to the whorehouse, I hear. There's kings for you. Another day. Fuck him, snapped Leo, more harshly than he'd meant to. I've been with Isha, and Huygen, and Barazin. Ah, the great minds of the Open Council. Her total calmness was only making him angrier. It was how his mother would have behaved, but with more of an edge. What did they have to discuss? Nothing much. Only civil war. State of the government and its violent overthrow. Banter, you know. It had been banter, hadn't it? Or had they been deadly serious? Had he been deadly serious? He turned away to frown out of the window through the darkened trees towards the lights on the middle way. He heard the rustle as she stood. Is something bothering you? No. Only future treason and past affairs. Come now. She came to stand beside him. There should be no secrets between husband and wife. Not on the first day, anyway. You're right. He turned to look at her. But we hardly know each other, do we? We spent one night together. Part of one night. Part of one night. I know you own things, manufactories and mills and mines. I recently acquired a large stake in the Lord Governor of Angland, in fact. Ha! Huh. And he got one in you. She cocked her head to one side. Worried over your investment? Not till I spoke to Celeste Dan Huygen. I wouldn't take anything she told you too seriously. The woman hates me almost as much as I hate her. She told me. Leo had a feeling if he said it, there'd be no going back. But he had to know the truth. That, and his leg was burning, and the day and the week and the month had been full of frustrations, and he felt like a fight. She told me you and the king were lovers. There was a long pause. Savine didn't so much as twitch. A woman made from porcelain could have given more away. 
And what did you say? I told her if she repeated it, I'd break her fucking nose. That I'd rather like to see. Is it true? Had you imagined I was a virgin? Any doubts on that score were put to rest in Swarbrick's office. Her eyes narrowed ever so slightly. As I recall, you were far from a reluctant visitor. Not the only one, by all accounts. Is it true? A muscle worked in her jaw. She hid it well, but he could feel the anger coming off her. He rather liked it. The king and I have some history. She was breathing hard through her nose, chest rising and falling. But that is what it is. History. It's nothing for you to— Is the child mine? he asked. Her eyes narrowed further, hard creases spreading around the bridge of her nose, chin angrily pointed up at him. How can you ask me that? Is there even a child? She hit him. Not some theatrical little tickle. She hit him as hard as she could with an open hand, and for someone of her size she hit shockingly hard. It made a sharp smack, knocked his breath out in a sharp gasp, snapped his face sharply sideways, and made him stagger against the window frame. There was a pause, which felt very long. Then he turned slowly back towards her, and he stared at her, and she at him. Leo, she whispered, lifting a trembling hand. I... Leo caught it by the wrist. Shh! Shock! had turned to excitement, and excitement to a thrill that reached every part of him. Very slowly, very deliberately, he lifted her hand up and let go of it. His breath came fast, almost painful in his throat. The blood had flooded to his face, making it burn and tingle, but you could have said just the same for his cock. Very slowly, very deliberately, without taking his eyes from hers, he turned his unslapped cheek towards her. He thought he saw the slightest smile at the corner of her mouth as he said the word. Again. The next slap was no softer than the first. He would have been disappointed if it had been. How fucking dare you! she hissed, stepping close, breath hot on his stinging face. He gave a kind of whimper as she caught him around the throat, kissing him, biting him. Her other hand was already busy with his belt. He kissed her back, clumsily, angrily, tangled his fingers in her hair, and it shifted in his hands. A wig. It came loose, skewed. She twisted it off and flung it away. She looked shockingly different without the softness of it, hair clipped to dark stubble, lips curled back in a snarl, paint smeared from one eye down her cheek in a black streak. She shoved him. He didn't even try to stay standing, caught his head on an occasional table as he fell, bit his tongue and sprawled on his back, surrounded by scattered ornaments. Marshal Croy stared down at him from the heavy frame. His feelings on the business were hard to judge. You! Fucking worthless shit, she hissed, ripping Leo's trousers down around his ankles. He gave a dumb moan of excitement with every breath, shivering, trembling, wriggling up onto his elbows. He could see the wall in her hair at the crown of her shaved head as it bobbed up and down, lapping, slurping. Fuck, he whimpered, dropping back. Almost painful, almost painful, then definitely painful. By the dead, his leg was on fire, trapped under her at the wrong angle. Fuck! His mouth tasted of blood. He reached out desperately, caught the claw-carved leg of an armchair, and gripped it like a man hanging from a cliff by a tree root, carpet rucking up around his shoulders as he wriggled helplessly. Fuck! Ha! Ha! She clambered over him, dragging her skirts up around her chest with a ripping of gauzy fabric, and a couple of pearls popped free and rolled, twinkling away. He reached for her, wanting to drag her down, wanting to kiss her, but she caught his wrist. Don't fucking touch me! She forced his arm down above his head, pinned it against the floor. 
She was strong, but not that strong. He could have flung her across the room if he'd wanted to. He wanted nothing less. Skirts tickled him under the chin as she straddled him, muscles twitching around her sharp collarbones as she reached down, and somewhere in that mass of rustling fabric gripped hold of his cock. Stay, she breathed, lips twisted around gritted teeth. There. She worked her hips in circles, she giving a little growl and he a little sob each time she pushed lower. Her face inched closer until her open mouth pressed against his open mouth. And they bit and snapped and grunted at each other, squirming on the carpet of their meticulously decorated living room. The King's Pimp Orso puffed out his cheeks as he rearranged his hand. Awful hand. Utter crap. I suppose it's comforting, in a way, he murmured, that some things don't change. The same table in the same little place they'd always favoured. The same overwrought furniture and the same threadbare drapery. The girls were different and looked even more nervous than they used to. But then the girls were always different and always looked nervous. It all seemed a little sadder than he remembered but maybe he was the sad one. Oh, and six knights of the body stood about the walls, bristling with weaponry, trying to look as inconspicuous as half a dozen fully armoured men can in a brothel, which proved to be not very. Corporal Tunney didn't appear to notice. He was a man who could play cards through battle, flood or riot, and indeed claimed to have done so on more than one occasion. Oh, we're still here and he carelessly nudged a few more coins into the pot. "'Can't see that changing,' said Yoke, filling up everyone's glasses again. Also really should have told him not to, but he was too drunk to bother. "'Unless the king were to go to war again, of course,' Tunney raised his grey brows significantly at Orso. "'In which case, my standard-bearing services are always at your majesty's disposal.' Glad to know that my standard, if nothing else, would be competently handled. Also tossed his awful hand away with a flourish. But I think I've had quite enough of war. You show more wisdom than your father in that case. Tunney started to rake in the pot. I'll have to stick to procuring whores for your majesty. How do you feel about being the king's pimp? Also let go a burp. A royal burp, he supposed. He'd been drinking all day, hadn't helped, never did. Dare say there are worse jobs. Tunney gripped his pipe between his yellowed teeth as he shuffled. Less marching than in the standard-bearing game, at least. More fighting, mind you, but at least there's the chance of making people happy. Sure you won't join us, Colonel Gorst? Gorst shook his head, eyes eternally roving around the dim room as though a Styrian assassin might spring from the dresser at any moment. If one had, also never doubted, Gorst would have been ready with the utmost extremes of lethal force. You two know each other? Also looked from the old bodyguard to the old standard bearer. They were probably of an age, but otherwise could hardly have been less alike. Fought together at the Battle of Osrum said Tunney, starting to deal. Well, I say fought. He fought. I just sat there. Yoke raised a finger. I sat there too. So you did, boy. And you even managed to do that badly. Yoke grinned. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's doing things badly. I hear you sentenced Wetterland to dangle, said Tunney, still flicking out cards. I did, said Orso. Terrible decision. Everyone says he's guilty, threw in Hildy, who was sitting cross-legged on the dresser between two large candlesticks shaped like naked women. Guilty as hell, said Orso. So you should have let him off? That would have been a terrible decision, too. Yoke's face crinkled up with incomprehension, its usual expression. So... I tried to manage a compromise in which he'd get life in prison, probably to worm his way out when nobody was looking. Compromise is always a good idea, 
threw in one of the whores, also raised his brows at her, and she blushed and looked at the floor. So I thought, but it turned out to be the worst option of all. I made the fatal mistake of trying to improve things, and of trusting Lord Bloody Isha. He scraped up his hand and started sorting through it. A king can only select from a range of wrong choices and bad outcomes. Another awful hand, even worse than the last. A lifetime of trying to ferret out the least worst in a mist of lies, stupidity, and imperfect information. Sounds like the army life, muttered Tunny. Wish you'd come to me first. I could have told you Ish is a snake. I should put you on my closed council. Also paused a moment, looking at his glass. Actually, I've had worse ideas. Hi, Justice Tunny! Hildy gave a giggle, and a couple of the girls laughed, and also thought he even heard a snort from one of the knights of the body. Charmed by the offer, Your Majesty, said Tunny dryly, but corporals as high as I go. Leo Dan Brock would make a fine king, don't you think? asked also. Don't you think, with those shoulders? He's pretty, said Hildy, twisting her old soldier's cap off so her blonde curls popped out in a mop, then twisting it back on. He's very pretty, said one of the girls, and the others nodded agreement. Bold, said York thoughtfully. Very manly. Reckless, piped Gorst. Also turned to him, surprised. It might have been the first time he'd ever heard the man volunteer a word of conversation. He shrugged, armour faintly rattling. Kings need cool tempers, and he went back to frowning about the room. Also turned to the table to find the madam leaning over him in an explosion of heavily daubed perfume and lightly veined bosom. My one interest, your august majesty. She traced a wiggly line on the tabletop in a manner that was perhaps intended to be arousing. In anything? Also sighed. Fucking wise, it is what we do here. The girl who had extolled the virtues of compromise gave also a slightly desperate smile. His shoulders slumped. Do you know, I'm not sure I could even manage it. It's not you. It's not any of you. It's me. Commoners, nobles, Starrickland, Angland, and Midland, everyone bloody hates me. Hasn't Westport decided it likes you, after all? asked Hildy. Also ignored her. He was in a mood only for bad news. It's a union indeed, united in their dislike for their king. That's what a king's there for, said Tunny. High or low, we all need someone to blame. Who do I get to blame? asked Orso. Whoever you like, murmured Yoke, frowning at his cards. Your king. My closed council, my open council, the boy who empties my bloody chamber pot too, I shouldn't wonder. They all think I'm a fucking... Who cares a shit what they think? shouted Tunny, jerking forward and stabbing at Orso with the stem of his pipe. Long as they bloody obey. Your king, boy. Not me, not Yoke, and not Leo damn bloody Brock. You. Now... I dare say being king has its downsides, but I can tell you there are worse jobs. Hm, <laughs> grunted one of the girls, adjusting her bodice. All this bloody self-pity. It was fun when you were a crown prince, but fuck, it doesn't suit a king. Tunny took a pull on his pipe, but it was dead, and he angrily smacked the ashes out on the tabletop. Get back to the palace and get on with it. We'll miss you, but these lovely ladies need to make some money, and you're scaring away the guests. There was a long silence. Orso glanced about the room. Everyone, the girls, the knights, the madam, Hildy and Yoke, even Bremerdan Gorst, had the same expression. Mouth tight shut and eyes wide open, an expression that seemed to say, I can't believe he said it, but it definitely needed saying. I see. Also tossed down his cards and stood with only a small wobble. Gorst, we're going back to the palace. Hildy, could you see everyone paid for their time, please? 
She frowned over at him. You already owe me sixty. I think we know I'm good for it. We do? I'll talk to the Lord Chancellor and have you written into the budget. How's that? As the knights tramped down the stairs to leave, Orso leaned close to Tunny. Thank you for that, Corporal. Without looking up from his cards, Tunny gave a grudging nod. Any time, Your Majesty. The Darling of the Slums Morning, Your Grace, said Leo, stepping out onto the balcony. Morning, Your Grace, said Savine, as he sat opposite her at the breakfast table and gingerly stretched out his leg. She shifted subtly, trying not to let her own discomfort show. A comfortable corset really isn't doing its job, but her belly was most definitely starting to swell. Sabine had been softening all over since she gave up fencing. Gripping a sword made her think too much of Valbeck, scrabbling with the hilt in a sweaty panic as she tried to pull up that loose board, men screaming for her blood outside the door. So, Leo frowned out towards the middle way, where the morning's traffic was already busy, then gave a helpless little laugh. We're married, then! Savine banished the ugly memories and held up the new ring she had commissioned, its satisfyingly colossal stone flashing in the morning sun. So it would appear. What happens now? I recommend the trout. And then? Give me and Zuri a week here to put my affairs in order, and then to Angland, where you can put my affairs in order, where I can help you put them in order and people might care less about appearances, and Zuri would not have to haul quite so savagely on the laces. Probably best that we leave before Wetterlant's hanging. I might hold off on saying sorry to His Majesty as well. Savine winced. I hope my history with the King will not— If he's fool enough to let the most beautiful woman in the Union slip through his fingers, then I pity him and Leo gave her that big boyish smile, the one that made a faint groove from the scar on his cheek. She found she was smiling back, and not even having to pretend. That's a rather lovely thing to say. Don't get used to it. He scooped a piece of trout onto his plate, then sucked the fork. I'm not much of a flatterer. Oh, I think you could prosper at anything you put your mind to. He smiled even wider. That's a rather lovely thing to say. I'm one of the best flatterers in the Union. Ask anyone. He laughed and started eating, and she rather enjoyed watching him. So strong and healthy and handsome. No sign of last night's anger now. Except perhaps a faint pink graze her open hand had left on his cheek. The young lion had his moods, but it seemed they passed quickly, like storm clouds sweeping over the rugged northern valleys, and just as quickly letting the sun shine again. She could work with that. Who doesn't have moods, after all? Savine had been in one ever since she got back from Valbeck. Harun had to squeeze his great shoulders together to fit through the door onto the balcony. Spillian Swarbrek is here, Lady Savine. A few months in Adua, and he had barely any accent at all. Thank you, Haroon, you're a treasure. Send him out. Leo frowned after him. Not sure how your servants will go down in Angland. Angland will just have to get used to them. Haroon and Rabbik are Zuri's brothers, and they're some of the most diligent, conscientious, trustworthy people I know. Haroon used to be an officer in the Emperor's army, I believe, and Rabbik's an absolute magus with horses. As for Zuri, she was Savine's closest friend, and the very thought of her being unwelcome somewhere made her want to grind that place under her heel. She is indispensable. My business interests would suffer more without her than without me. I would trust her with our lives. Leo prodded at his fish. Just feels like there are too many brown faces around in Adua these days. Too many for what? The people who come here are hard workers. They bring wealth and energy and new ideas. There are great thinkers among them, great engineers. And how would you stop them, anyway? Make us less prosperous? 
Leo did not look convinced. He was not a man much moved by reason. We fought a war against the Gurkish, he grumbled. You fought a war against the Northmen. Some of your best friends are still Northmen. He actually looked slightly offended. Not all Northmen are the same, you know. There was a snapping of cloth, and Swarbrick swept onto the balcony, became briefly entangled in the drapes, but manfully fought his way free. He was fresh from another trip to the far country, and was affecting the facial hair of a fearless adventurer. Your Grace, he intoned, giving Savine a flourishing bow. You look a veritable goddess, as always. Master Swarbrick, how was your latest escapade in the unsettled West? Wild and parked with danger, I have tales to tell which the pampered citizens of Adjo will scarcely credit. Sabine certainly would not credit them, for she had it on good authority that he rarely strayed far from the harbour at Rostod, and paid a scout to wear his clothes while riding across the plains, so they would have an authentically adventured-in appearance on his return. And may I introduce my husband, Leo Dan Brock? Your grace, Swarbrick gave an even more flourishing bow. An absolute honour to make the acquaintance of the hero of Red Hill and conqueror of the Great Wolf. I don't like to talk about that, said Leo sternly. Swarbrick blinked, mouth slightly open. Leo burst out laughing. It's all I'd bloody talk about if I had my way. And he seized Swarbrick's hand and nearly dragged the hapless writer off the balcony with the vigour of his shaking. I think I visited your office once. Swarbrick must have guessed what they had used his office for, but to his credit he gave no sign of it. My humble premises are forever at your disposal, as is my humble pen. I have a use in mind for the latter, and Savine nudged a chair out with one shoe so Swarbrick could sit. The name Glockter carries something of a stigma. A proud name, but I see your grace's point. There is a flavour of torture? Swarbrick gave an apologetic smile. The name Brock has entirely different connotations. Heroism, patriotism, daring do. Have you considered a biography, by the way, your grace? Leo paused with fork halfway to his mouth. I'm twenty-two years old. I hope I've a few achievements still to come. Your famous victories thus far are, one cannot doubt, but a prelude, but there would be great public interest even in a first volume or two. My name, Savine reminded him. Of course, my apologies. New ideas are ropped and must be thrust aside. A curse of the artistic temperament. Far from the only one, in her opinion. Savine Dan Glockter was a woman of business, she explained. She needed a reputation for cunning, ruthlessness, and flinty resolve. She needed the confidence of investors, the respect of partners, the awe of debtors, mused Swarbrick. But Savine Dan Brock, Lady Governor of Angland, might be a woman of the people? A woman who balances wisdom with warmth and generosity? A woman who struggles tirelessly for the common good? Kernsbick was always saying that he suspected Savine of hiding a generous heart. Perhaps the time had come to put it on public display. What do you think about a series of pamphlets discussing my charitable work in the three farms? Nothing too obvious, you understand. I am all in the subtext. Swarbrick sat back, considering the trees in the garden as though their branches were laden with weighty revelations. It would help if we could find our way to a place of honesty. I hope you will not think me indelicate if I suggest we might make use of your experiences during the uprising in Valbeck. Savine felt a sick surge of fear, then a sting of annoyance at her own weakness. All it took was a mention of the place to set her heart thumping and turn her mouth sour to send that tickling shiver up her back. A voice came strangled. How do you mean? You lived among the common folk there. The broad's cramped apartment, her bed of rags, the cries echoing through the blistering walls. 
Their daily trials were yours. Up to her knees in the cold river, throat raw from smoke, endlessly filling buckets to put out fires that could not be put out. The hunger, queuing for vegetable peelings and grateful to get them. The danger, the sound of the gangs outside, the screams in the night. The daily want, her wheezing breath as she dragged herself through the machinery, blood spattering the floor. Of course, she barked, knuckles white as she gripped at the edge of the table. A place of honesty. If Swarbrick could spin diamonds out of shit, good luck to him. Where the hell had she put her pearl dust? A story of personal growth, the writer was musing, of dangers faced and trials braved, a woman born to privilege, coming through the fire of struggle to understand the plight of the common man. He took a self-satisfied breath. Powerful. Are you aware of Carme Groom? She did some sketches for My Life of Dab Sweet, one of the best artists in Adur, but she is not in the greatest demand because she is a she. Indeed. A few etchings can truly make a pamphlet sing. Words are powerful, but an image can shortcut the reason and speak directly in the language of the heart. Savine snapped her fingers. Done. We can visit the three farms this afternoon. Once she and Zuri had calculated the precise minimum a reputation for charity could be bought for. Then I shall make the arrangements at once, said Swarbrick, springing up. Your Grace, your Grace. Do think about that biography, and he ducked back through the window. So, that's the famous writer, asked Leo. He has some of the bravest facial hair I've ever seen despite being one of the biggest cowards in the Union. I suppose if he was brave, he wouldn't need such brave facial hair. And if everyone was brave, what would make you special? Well, he gave her that grin again, I am married to the cleverest woman in the Union. Stop, she said, smiling as she leaned towards him. By which I mean don't. I won't. But pamphlets? Absolutely. Etchings? The language of the heart. Do you really think people are that stupid? Darling, she leaned closer and kissed him gently and touched him lightly on the tip of his nose with her fingertip. People are far more stupid than that. The city closed in around them, and like a rake falling into a life of debauchery, turned mean, twisted, sick and dirty. High above, so high that it seemed no one could ever reach it, a narrow crack of sky showed between the crumbling tenements. And so we pass into the three farms, Swarbrick spoke in an urgent whisper, scribbling away in his notebook. Perhaps the most infamous of Adua's districts, once largely burned, then brutally occupied by the savage Gurkish, now rendered into an endless night, no, a perpetual dusk, by the smoke of the manufactories, and a moral murk even more complete in which, what, in which the light of hope is extinguished for its thousands of wretched inhabitants. Can I find a place for the word crepuscular, do you think? I tried to find a place for it in every sentence, said Kami Groom, her fair brows raised very high. Not much of a reader myself, said Leo, leaning close, but he sounds a bit overwrought. Savine shrugged. That's what people consider good writing these days. He nodded towards a pair of ragged boys shoveling horse dung onto a rotting wagon. What are they doing? Making a living. Out of shit? All you need is a shovel and a poor sense of smell. Savine made an utterly futile effort to wriggle some room into her overtight collar. And good senses of smell don't last long around here. Stay close, your graces. Broad went with fists clenched, frowning into the shadows. Shadows were one of the few things there was no shortage of in the three farms. 
In some of the narrower lanes you would hardly have known it was day. This is no place for wealthy folk to walk alone, nor writers and artists neither. Never fear, called out Swarbrick. I learned well the value of a stout escort out in the wilds. Where did you find your man Broad? murmured Leo. In Valbeck. He and his family took me in. I've no doubt they saved my life. So you took them in? Leo was grinning at her. You do have a heart. A generous one, according to my friend Kernsvik. But settling one's debts is simply good business, and the broads are all useful people. No doubt. That's a ladderman's tattoo on his hand, you know. First men onto the walls in a siege. Most deadly duty in the whole army. And four stars means he did it four times. Leo glanced sideways at Broad. That is a dangerous man. Savine remembered him facing down six burners that first night in Valbeck and stomping their leader's head into the cobbles, the fear she had felt and the relief. Calm, Savine whispered under her breath. Calm, calm, calm. We live these days in a segregated society. Swarbrick was burbling, nudging up his eye lenses with the end of his pencil. A stratified world, where rich and poor rarely mingle. No, wait, mingle is weak. They passed under the great chimney of assault works, walls black with crusted soot. Flies buzzed around a dead horse. Three ragged children played in the gutter. Every other building here was a jerry shop. Everyone at least halfway drunk, or so ill they looked drunk. Most of the rest were pawn shops, sad little fragments of broken lives priced low in their grubby windows. The gap between rich and poor has never been wider. The chasm has never yawned so deep. But one woman dares to bridge the divide. Swarbrick gave a delighted cackle. Bridge the divide, that's lovely! She, like few others among the wealthy and noble, goes forth among the people. She, like few others, understands their plight. Sabine did understand it, but if she truly went to a place of honesty, all she really felt was glad she was no longer one of these wretched ghosts. All she really wanted was to get back to her palatial rooms and her conscientious servants as soon as possible. That familiar smell of sweat, piss, damp and rot, mixed with the acrid scratch of the furnaces, was hard to ignore as they worked their way deeper into the gloomy maze of streets. Strange how smells can bring memories back so sharply. She realized she had her box of pearl dust in her hand, forced herself to push it back up her sleeve. She was free. She was safe. She told herself so over and over. Calm. Calm, calm. These buildings. Leo gazed up at the slumping offences against architecture crowding over them, blooms of green damp flaring from their leaking gutters. The land is short-leased, so it isn't worth the landlord's while to build well or to repair what's built badly. The houses fall apart with the families inside. Who would know better than Savine? She owned dozens of similar buildings herself. Why no window frames? The tenants tear them out in the cold months and burn them for firewood. By the dead! Behind them, Swarbrick scratched on in his notebook. We speak, of course, of none other than her grace, and grace is the right word, dear friends. Savine Danbrock, wife to the young lion. Bride, maybe? Bride is youthful said Kami Groom, plucking out one of the pencils shoved through her shambolic bun and causing half of it to collapse across her face. Bride bursts with potential. Bride of the young lion and the new lady governor of Angland. They had made it to the very heart of the slum, an unpaved square with stagnant water gathered in puddles, thick with scum and blooms of multicolored oil. A strange building stood at one side, an ancient low house with a sagging, moss-covered roof. What is that? asked Leo. One of the three farms, said Savine. 
that stood here before the city swallowed them. Hard to imagine anything ever grew here. One pig screamed at another as they fought in a mound of filth. Someone shouted drunken abuse in a tongue she did not recognize. A cheap flute tooted hopelessly, blending with the mindless music of steam hammers in a foundry across the way. Zuri waited with Haroon and Rabik and two of Broad's men. She had gathered a queue of the most wretched, a lot of dark faces among them. Refugees from the collapse of the Empire of Gurkle, seeking safety and sanity, and finding little of either. Thank you, Zuri. Savine swallowed her nausea. You've done a miraculous job, as always. I fear there are no miracles down here. Zuri frowned towards the procession of the desperate. It reminded Savine of the queues she had stood in for one of the few working pumps in Valbeck. The long walk back with the heavy buckets bruising her calves, water slopping at her legs, the unbearable aching in her shoulders with every step. Calm, calm, fucking calm. Rabbik watchfully held her purse while she took coins from it and pressed them into filthy, calloused, broken hands. Hands missing fingers and thumbs from mishaps at machinery. Hands of beggars, children, whores and thieves. With Haroon's help, Leo was handing out loaves from a cart, clapping people on the back, shaking his head at their thanks, throwing open his brimming heart and spraying well wishes. Savine said nothing. She was worried if she opened her mouth she might drown the neighborhood in spew. As Lady Brock moves through those darkened streets, it is as if a lamp shines. No, a beacon, lighting the way to a better life for these neglected unfortunates, as if the sun breaks through the smoke of the manufactories. She gives out bread, yes, she gives out comfort, surely, she gives out silver with an open hand, but more valuable than all, she gives out hope. Very nice, murmured Kami Groom, eyes flickering over the scene as she pinned her hair back up with a clip from her drawing board and began to sketch. Isn't it? said Swarbrick. All shrouded in secrecy, though, we must make that point. We have stumbled upon her anonymous generosity. She would blush to hear it spoken of, for she is the personification of humility. Or modesty? Modesty or humility? Why not both? Is this what Valbeck was like? Leo muttered at Savine. Before the uprising, maybe. Then it got worse. We picked through the dung heaps for something we could eat. What can we do for them? I should have brought my purse. Never used the bloody thing. He really did have a big heart. It made her strangely glad to know that someone did. A big heart, but not the biggest brain. Help to these people was a coin tossed in a pool. It might make a few ripples, but they would quickly vanish as though they had never been. The bread would be gone in one swallow. The money would be wasted on drink and husk, a moment of sweet oblivion. Perhaps, at best, some tatty heirloom temporarily reclaimed from the pawn shop. Who, on account of her charity, no, selflessness, on account of her remarkable charity and selflessness, has become known among the common folk of Adua as... Hmm... A little urchin with a scabby rash across her face gazed up as Savine pressed a coin into her palm. She felt crushed, like a swineherd being smothered by hungry pigs. Do you need much more? she snapped. Almost there, said Kami Groom, freckled face wrinkled with concentration as she drew. Benefactor, mused Swarbrick, the benefactor of the three farms? To Colt. Savine flinched at a shower of sparks from an open shed door. She felt trapped in this stinking gloom. She felt almost as trapped as she had in Valbeck. She had to get out. The saint? Swarbrick raised his brows high. Of the hovels? Too religious. We're not in Gurkle. No, we are very much in the slums of Adua. That girl with the rashy face had caught Savine's skirts. 
clutching at the only kindness that had ever been shown her, perhaps, no matter how much of a sham it was. Leo was watching with tears in his eyes. If they stayed much longer, he would probably adopt the little limpet. Savine's greasy skin was crawling. She wanted nothing more than to kick the girl off into the gutter, forced herself, by a towering effort of will, to keep the smile nailed to her face as Rabbik tried to gently peel her dirty hands away. How about— Tommy Groom narrowed her eyes at the scene, scratching thoughtfully at the side of her nose with her pencil. The darling of the slums. Oh, my dear! Swarbrick looked up wide-eyed from Kami's paper to Savine, holding up his hands as though framing a painting with her as its subject, that desperate orphan clinging to her feet. You should be a writer! Deadwood New Shoots It was a sunny spring morning when Ricker walked back into Ufrith. She used to feel a rush of warmth passing through those weather-pitted gates, hearing the gulls and the chatter, smelling the sea. She used to reap a happy harvest of smiles and waves on the way to her father's hall. There goes Ricker. She's mad as a shield made of bread, but we like her. Coming home. By the dead, she needed that feeling then. But things had changed since she went to the Forbidden Lake, and not just because she kept getting surprised on her right-hand side. The left was full of sad shocks, too. Folk she'd have called friends stared as she passed, like they saw the dead walk, slunk off and wouldn't meet her one good eye. Folk who used to smile looked scared, shocked, disgusted even. One woman, Ricca had never been able to shut up about the weather, herded her three children inside at the sight of her and slammed the door. Till that moment, She'd been tricking herself that everything would drift back to normal, or as close to it as her life got. Five steps into town, it was clear no one would ever look at her the same again. Stung somewhat, but she wasn't about to let it show. She buried her hurts, like grown-ups were meant to, and tried to walk the way she'd seen Savine Dan Glock to walk. Shoulders back, chin up making no apologies, like Ufrith was hers, and these bastards only got to live here because she was in a good mood. She leaned close to Shivers without letting the knowing half-smile slip. I look that bad? You look better than me, he said, which was scant encouragement. They'll get used to it, said Isern. A scruffy little girl with a scruffy little dog gawped as she passed. The dog couldn't take its shocked eyes off her either. People can get used to pretty much anything, said Ricker. That's why they'll get used to it. Ricker? A boy stood with a half-eaten apple forgotten in his hand, his eyes big and round and fixed on her face. She squatted down to ruffle his scruffy hair. You've changed some, he said, still staring. I. You used to be all twitchy. She lifted her hand up and held it still. It was steady as the line between sea and sky. Seems I'm cured of that, she said. You cured of smiling, too. I can still smile, you cheeky shrimp. Though when she forced a grin out, it felt strange on her face, the skin still raw where the tattoos were drawn. Can you see all right? Can't see at all with this eye. She winked at him with the right, and it made no difference. She took a hard breath as she stood, watched the grey sea shifting. But the other sees better than ever. There were a lot of people gathered in front of her father's hall. There were always folk wanting something from him, always wanting more than he had to give, whether it was silver or men or reassurance or favour. They'd drained him dry of all of them down the years. Hardbread hastened up the cobbled road, his white hair wild. When he got close enough for his weak old eyes to get her measure, he froze. Hardbread, she said, giving him a nod. Ricker, he sounded more than a little sick. That you? I, I cut my hair. 
He stared at her some more. Ricker, I have to tell you something. It'll have to wait. Need to talk to my da. That's the thing. What's the thing? She asked as she shoved the doors of the hall wide and stopped, her weight all on one wobbling foot. Oh, no. And she sagged like a scarecrow had its pole ripped out. Kaurib had warned her the long eye wouldn't keep her safe from all life's axes. Oh, no! Her father lay on the table, his old notched sword on his chest. His hair and his beard were white. His face and his hands were white. His eyes were closed. Oh, no! Everyone watching her, silent, slipping out of her way as she walked up, like you might from someone had the plague. She stopped by the table, looking down at her father. Seemed he had the ghost of a smile about his mouth. He never smiled enough, she whispered. I, said Shivers, soft and low. Those were the times he lived through. He done the best he could with them. None better, said Isern, and she took a long breath and puffed it out ragged. <sighs> Back to the mud. Ricca put her fingertips on her father's cheek. Peace at last, Ada, she whispered, and her right eye tickled and stung and leaked. Might not see any more, but it could cry still. Her left stayed dry, though. Greenway reined in hard and slithered from his saddle, got his foot caught in one stirrup in his haste, and nearly fell. The dog man's dead! he screeched. Silence, while a breeze blew up and whisked some fallen blossom across the road. Silence, while everyone wondered how Stour would take the news so they could take it the same way. Then the young king tipped back his head and roared with laughter, and as if that was permission given, they all set to chuckling too. All of them except Clover. He weren't really in the mood. What was it Shima Heartless said? asked Stour, wiping his wet eyes. There's only one kind of good news, and that's dead enemies. Reckon those sorry bastards will be joining the North sooner than we hoped, eh, Clover? Prefer to eat the eggs I've got, my king, rather than the ones still up in the tree. Good point, Clover, good point. Stour grinned his wolf grin, and with a snapping of cloth, pulled his wolf cloak around his shoulders. Let's take nothing for granted. We'll head straight into Wolfrith, pay our respects, or the lack of them. Then we can talk to Oxel, see how things stand. Oxel's there, said Greenway. I seen him. Lovely. Stour rubbed his palms together with a faint hissing. That's happy timing. Auspicious timing. Auspicious is the word, eh, Clover? It's a word, said Clover under his breath. How about red hat and hardbread? Aye, they were there with their long grave faces, and I hear the dogman's daughter too. Ah, yeah, that Clover. We've caught up to that fucking little bitch at last. This'll be fun. Ain't nothing prettier than a pretty girl crying, eh? There really was nothing to be said to that. The sun was shining in Ufrith, but the place had a sullen feel. The dogman had been loved, few men more and it looked like his daughter weren't the only one felt they'd lost a father. Mourners gathered in a long queue, grave gifts in their hands, but Stour strode grinning past them, lapping up their scowls and their curses. He was one of those men loves to be despised, that treats loathing like gold to be clawed for and hoarded up. He hadn't learned yet that hates the one thing never runs out. There was quite the gathering inside the hall. Named men, fussed up in their best, gold and jewels glittering in the gloom, on helms and hilts. Oxel was there, as expected, and Red Hat and Hardbread, glaring at each other almost as much as at Stour. Call Shivers, too, though his only finery was a blood-red stone on his little finger, and the only glint on him was from his metal eye. Issa Nifail sat on a step, slowly chewing, long spear across her knees, and as Stour strode in, she made a long sucking through the hole in her teeth that spoke her scorn louder than any words. 
lots of weapons in that hall, lots of sorrow and lots of anger, and Clover made sure he knew where all the doors were. When a great man dies, those left over always take a moment working out where their loyalties are most fruitfully laid, and there's a high risk of bloodshed in the meantime. He'd seen one funeral turn into several often enough. The dogman himself lay pale on the long table, scarred shield under his feet, a hint of drama from a shaft of light falling on him through the smoke hole. A woman stood over him in the shadows, back to the door. Her red-brown hair was clipped short, and it made her neck look very long and very thin, blue veins standing stark up the side. Stower strode into the silent hall, steel toes on his boots scraping. I just had to pay my respects, voice dripping contempt, not caring a shit, as usual, for anyone's feelings but his own. Then the woman turned, and that shaft of light caught her smile, and Stower shuffled to an uncertain halt. So did his men. A dozen warriors always keen to advertise their courage, but they all checked at the sight of her, and Clover hardly blamed them. By the dead, muttered Greenway, taking a nervy step back and near tripping over his own sword. The King of the Northmen, she raised her arms in delight. What a joy! The gates of Ufrith stand open to you, even though last time you visited you burned the place, eh? 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 The last A hissed through her gritted teeth, spit spraying. Rumour was the dogman's daughter was a witch, that she had the long eye. Clover hadn't taken it too seriously. Now it was hard to doubt. She'd turned so lean her face was like a skull, skin so stretched you fancied you could see through it, scabbed and angry around her left eye, across her forehead, her cheek, the bridge of her nose. Clover wondered if, of the two of them, her father looked the healthier. "'What the hell happened to you?' muttered Stower, giving voice to the thoughts of everyone in the hall, most likely. "'A sorceress said she could make me more ordinary,' said Ricca, "'or she could make me less. Guess which I chose.' She strutted closer, bony shoulders tipped back, bony chin tipped up, and the mingling of that battered face and that snake-like swagger and that friendly grin and those mad, mad eyes was really most off-putting. I've been in the high places, up in the mountains beside a lake. And she waved a hand, runes on thongs around her thin wrist clicking and clattering. Fine views! But the water was a little chilly on the toes, eh, Isern? Isern Ephael, no doubt used to being the weirdest in just about any company, was of a sudden looking workaday by comparison. I didn't paddle, she said, and spat some chagger juice across the floor. You should have. The kind of cold that burns all your doubts away. Whole business was and Ricker opened her eyes wide, so wide it seemed they might pop out. pop out of her pinched-in face. Eye-opening. I see right through you now, right through all of you. And she laughed, a jagged laugh, like she'd left her senses far behind her, and it didn't help at all that she was laughing at her father's funeral. Stower twisted his face sideways as she came close, like he was looking into a wind. Her right eye was all swollen, Many-coloured bruises on the bloated lids, and a great red stain all across the white of it, pupil shriveled to a milky pinprick. The pupil of the other yawned huge and black, and Clover saw the scabbed and angry skin around it was pricked with designs. A cobweb of black lines and letters, circles and symbols, so fine it seemed it couldn't have been drawn by men at all. Clover never saw a thing look so much like witch's work and the warriors muttered and shifted, a dozen big men edging back, fearful from one girl thin as a birch sapling. "'Fucking witch!' muttered one who came from over the crinner, making a holy sign across his chest. "'Should be burnt!' 
Ricker smiled at him, pointing with one thin finger. But it's you who'll die by fire, she smiled at Greenway. You on the water, and cause I've told you so, all the days you have left, you'll go in fear of streams and boats and wells and cups, and every drop of dew shall be a terror. She wagged that finger at him. But the water will find you out. It will leak in through the cracks in your life, no matter how you try to cork em up. I see the great leveller coming, and there are no bargains made with him. She stared at Stour and took a necklace of green stones she wore and dragged them back until they made a noose cutting into her thin neck. But it's steel for most of you. It takes no long eye to see that. She dropped the necklace and laughed again. Stay! You're all welcome. Stay, and I can tell you more. Not me, muttered Greenway, who should have been called Whiteway, he'd turned so pale. He blundered to the door and saw a bucket there put under a leak, and he shrank away from it, then scrambled out into the daylight. The rest of Stower's big men weren't far behind him. Seemed this hadn't turned out quite the fun he'd promised. The great wolf himself stayed to give the room a wet-eyed scowl. We'll be back, he barked out. Say that, witch! And he shoved past Clover and stalked from the hall. How rude! Ricker's pale eye and her red eyes slid across to Clover. You, I know. We met once, he said, in the woods and she'd come a long way from the stringy little scrap who fell at his feet then. She'd come a long, hard way by a crooked road, he reckoned. I remember, she said. Do you want to hear what's coming, Jonas Clover? Reckon I'd rather not. Wasn't easy to meet those strange eyes, one seeming too shallow and one too deep, but he made himself do it. Just wanted to say... I'm sorry about your father. Didn't know him well, but I wish I'd known him better. Ain't many left in the North you could say that much for. Why don't you stay? She asked, raising one brow. Seemed the other got shaved off when the tattooing was done. We can talk about what's coming. Do you know, I wish I could. And it was true. He'd rather have stayed with the witches and the dead than gone back out to Stour and his bastards. But I am what I am. Nightfall had the power, more even than before, with the dogman back to the mud, and Clover was done with losing sides. So he nodded to Issa Nifail, and nodded to Ricker, too. Then he turned for the door. Shivers stood in his path, that metal eye glinting in the shadows. We still need to have that talk. We do. Clover thought about giving Shivers a clap on the arm or something, but he didn't really seem the arm-clapping type. More than ever. Then he left. It was raining when they put him in the mud. Thin rain, making the whole world damp. Soft as a maiden's kiss, as he used to say. Seemed right, somehow, for the occasion. The gulls and the sea and the sad voices deadened. Everything deadened like the world was wrapped in a shroud. Usually, when a man goes in the ground, there are a few words said, words from his chief or his family, how good they were, how strong, how brave, how much missed they'll be by those staggering on. But today it seemed everyone in Ufrith had words. The little garden beside the hall was packed shoulder to shoulder, mourners spilling out into the wet lanes around. One by one they took their turn at the head of the fresh-turned earth, shuffling up to speak their peace, till the whole plot was boot-mashed, till the whole plot looked like a grave. Everyone had a story, some kindness done, some wisdom offered, some little piece of courage that had given them courage. Soft words spoke with smoking breath, tears lost in the drizzle. They said he'd been the best of his kind. The last straight edge, closest friend to the bloody nine, worst enemy to Black Dow, who'd fought for Bethod and fought against him across the north and back. 
Red Hat shouted out a story about the fight in the high places. Oxel barked one about the siege of Adua. Hardbread talked of the Battle of Osrung, folk murmuring with every famous name, Kerndon Craw and Wirren of Bly and Cairm Ironhead and Glamour Golden. He started at a creaky murmur, white hair plastered to his liver-spotted pate, but by the end he was glaring lightning and bellowing thunder as he told of the high deeds done in the valleys of the past. Old men made young again in the fire of those memories just for a moment. Then Shivers stepped up, one hand on the grey pommel of his grey sword, and with the other he pushed the hair back from his scarred face and spoke in that broken whisper. Some of you have had the misfortune of knowing me a long time. I used to be... He ran out of words a moment, stood there silent with teeth clenched. I was everyone's enemy, and my own most of all. A man who used up all his chances and didn't deserve another. But the dog man gave me one. In hard times it's easy to become hard. But here was a man who always looked for the best in folk. Didn't always find it, but never gave up looking. Wasted no time polishing his own name, singing his own songs. Didn't have to. Every man and woman in the North knew his quality. Back to the mud, dogman. And he gave the earth a slow nod. Feels like the best of us goes in the ground with you. Quiet, then, that heavy quiet, and Isern set a hand on Ricker's shoulder, a gentle hand for once, soft as the rain. You want to speak? You don't have to. Aye, said Ricker. I do. And she slipped through the damp-eyed crowd to the head of the grave. It was a good spot for him. In the garden he wished he'd tended better. Looking down over the city he'd fought for so many years. Looking down towards the sea. He'd have liked friends beside him, she reckoned. But their lonely graves were scattered across the north, wherever they'd died. That's a warrior's life, a warrior's death. She looked up, saw all those sad faces turned towards her, all waiting for her to say something worth hearing. Shit! she croaked, shaking her head at that heap of ground. She'd helped to pile it on him. There it was, dark in the grain of her hands, black under her fingernails. Still she couldn't believe he was under there, and wouldn't step smiling from the crowd to give the last best word. Fucking shit! She took a long, salty sniff and rubbed the wet from the blind side of her face. Been a fine thing, listening to you all. She tried to smile, but it came out all quivery and brittle. So many stories, so many burdens he took a little piece of onto his own shoulders. No wonder he was crooked at the end. No wonder. Guess we'll have to carry our own burdens now, or maybe all we'll share a little of the load between us. Folk held each other squeezed each other's hands. She wondered how long that good fellowship would last. Not long, was her guess. All them battles! Her voice had faded to a croak. She had to clear her throat to get it going again. All those great names he stood beside, fought against. His story was the story of the North for sixty years and more. You'd think he was the last of some race of giants to hear talk of his victories, but— And she grinned, despite herself. He was a small giant, my da. He'd rather have been growing things than killing them. Didn't get much of a chance at it, as this garden will testify. He was always going to tend to it tomorrow. But he loved to sit here, with the sun on his face. He could spend hours here looking to the sea hoping better times might roll in on the tide. She wished she had better words, ones that somehow bound up all he'd been to her, all the things felt but never said, all the holes he'd leave behind. But how can you fit all that in a bit of breath? 
By the dead, I was proud to be his daughter, she said. Folk can talk a lot of shit at a funeral, but even his enemies thought he was the best man in the North. She took a damp breath and blew it out hard, her lip trembling. That's all I got. Shivers put a hand on her shoulder. Good words, Ricker. Bit by bit, with shuffling feet and hanging heads, folk started to drift back to their lives. Bit by bit, the garden emptied. Ricker stood looking at the ground, wishing she could see through it, wishing she could force the long eye open and see her father's face again. But her eyes stayed cold as the rain and the sea and the cold ground.